Last time we talked about using the Our Father as a model for how to pray. That model shows us to begin with praise, make our requests and petitions known, and to end with praise and the acknowledgement of God's power. Now that model is certainly useful. I mean, it's how Jesus responded to the disciples when, he's, when they said, Lord, teach us to pray. <clears throat> But it's not the only way to pray. And it's not the only model. It's the beginning model for those who, like the disciples, want to learn how to pray. I just waved my hand over it and it disappeared. Been having that trouble all morning on the other computer. Oh well. But we, as we grow in our experience in the things of God. And as we grow, things change. Prayer is no different. We begin as children learning how to pray. But if we continue to pray the way we did when we knelt beside our bed with mama or daddy, then something gets lost in there. Not that it's not a good prayer, not that it's not heard. I don't think that there's a a bad prayer a child of God can utter. But we grow in our understanding and in our practice of prayer. We don't want to get stuck in a rut of doing one thing one certain way all the time. Now, there's many aspects to prayer and many ways to pray. And there's many different concerns that we have with prayer. We'll begin looking at some of these this morning, as we look at the, um, the scripture lesson that we had, the, the passage there was about prayer. It says, he began in, in verse 13 of James chapter 5, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. So we see there a difference in your emotional condition of the time and what is to be done. Now, all of us find this verse, I think, to be a reality in our lives, at, especially at one time or another. We suffer in one form or another. We can suffer mentally, physically, emotionally, financially, and in each of those, any number of ways. However, this verse does not apply to any of those. Notice that James does not say to pray about anything specific. He simply says to pray. The word that's translated suffering has a very specific meaning which is not conveyed by our English word suffering because we have such a broad um, perspective on it. This word that's translated suffering is only used four times in the New Testament. And yet we know there's a lot of suffering that goes on. I didn't touch it. I looked at it. Stay there. Quit laughing at me. The word that's used uh, does not refer so much to the distressing situation itself. You know, the the pain of suffering or, uh, you know, your financial distress or whatever it is. It doesn't refer to that specifically. It refers more to the burden that that situation brings in your life. Okay? Um, It's kind of hard to explain, for me to be able to explain it, But all of our situations, whatever they are, bring about a certain feeling, emotional condition, whatever. And that suffering is is more in that, speaking of that part, not the physical pain itself in the body, but the burden that that brings in your body. For instance, when I have a toothache, my whole body is a tooth. Okay, 
I mean, I, it, it, it's suffering. And it's that type of a burden that it's talking about. Now, the other places that the word is used may give us that insight because Paul said he was suffering in chains for the sake of the gospel. He was spiritually burdened by that situation, by his chains. But what was his prayer? That the chains be for the furtherance of the gospel, not that he be removed from his situation. So the two antithetical situations that are presented here of suffering and cheerfulness are essentially the things that are to drive us to prayer. They bring about a spiritual, or they're oriented towards driving us to prayer. Now, consider this verse from Paul's letter. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 26, he says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought. Has anybody ever been in that position where you, you know you want to pray, but you don't know what to pray for? Okay, that's what he's talking about here. But the Spirit himself... The Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Maybe there's a timer that got set on this thing that I don't know about. You know, in PowerPoint, you can set a timer. Maybe that's it. Sometimes our burden can become so great, we have no idea how to pray. We just know we're burdened. And that's what this verse is talking about. Sometimes, and this has been my experience with a lot of people, sometimes the burden may feel more like depression. And people begin to think that they're becoming depressed when in reality they're being driven down to their knees to pray. Maybe you could look at it that way sometime. Maybe you've had that experience and thought you were becoming depressed when the reality may have been a driving to prayer. And yet we don't know what to pray for. We don't know that there's anything going on. But those who become sensitive to the things in the world, to the things around them, to their friends, to the church members, whatever. You, Well, I'll just put it how a mother can sense when the child on the other side of the world is in trouble. Anybody want to explain that one? But it's a reality that occurs, and you may be sensitive to something that's going on, and you don't know what it is. But it is... Quite possibly the Spirit of God driving you to a place of prayer. God, I don't know what's going on. I don't even know who I'm praying for. But I am lifting up this thing that you've placed on my heart. I'm lifting it up right now. God, intercede, intervene, take part. It may very well be a prayer without words even. That can happen. We talked about that last time. Just a quiet, resting, and not resisting. You know, that's the hardest thing, especially for us as Americans, to resist a quiet spot. On radio, we call it dead air. Can't have it. It's a death knell. Okay? We, we resist the quiet. When, we, when you're in a discussion if you've ever led a, a Bible study or any kind of a discussion group and it gets quiet, as the leader, you could, you're going to start yammering away about something because we can't stand the quiet. But sometimes that's where we're supposed to be in prayer is quiet. Too often, though, prayer comes as a last resort rather than being our default mode. We go to prayer as the last thing we do. But that's what these verses are calling for. That's where we need to be for most any situation. Now, James goes on to write about a different kind of suffering, that of being sick in the body. He says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Now, there's a lot in those two verses there. A lot of things we need to consider. But James mentions sick twice, but the interesting thing is he uses two different words for each one of them. 
Two different types of sickness. The one that we're familiar with in verse 14 is the disease of the body. The second in verse 15 is the disease of life, of a life that has become weakened, mainly through sin. The life itself is messed up. Now, both of these verses carry a conditional promise, but I think we have often failed to see. It says that we, the sick one, is to call for the elders of the church. We're to call for the elders. Let me tell you a story about calling for the elders of the church. You remember the girl I told you about who stood up one day and testified that God loved art because she read Our Father Who Art in Heaven. Well, one day she called me up. Her father-in-law was sick, Mr. Bloom. He had not eaten in three weeks, was sleeping on the couch. His kidneys were failing him. He couldn't get upstairs. And for three weeks this has been going on, and she called the elders of the church. So I called another brother, and we went over to pray for Mr. Bloom. Now, Mr. Bloom was not a believer by any stretch of the imagination. This was just his daughter-in-law doing something. And if I'm honest with you, I went in there with zero faith. I had no confidence, no faith at all. I was fulfilling an obligation. That's all I was doing. I was doing my duty. Well, Bill and I laid hands on Mr. Bloom and prayed for him and uh, just talked a little bit about it to him and about his situation and comforted the family. And then we left. I got a call that night. 30 minutes after we left, he went upstairs, lay down and went to sleep. Got up a few hours later and asked for something to eat. Zero faith on the part of the prayer warriors. I have no idea about Mr. Bloom and where, he, where his faith was. All I know is there was a miracle of God that was operating in that time. And he continued in that condition for six more weeks until he finally got a kidney transplant. Otherwise, he would have died before the kidney became available. Don't ask me to explain it. I cannot. But I do know that someone called in faith for the elders of the church. And too often, we expect the pastor or the elders to know that we're sick and that they should know it is their job to pray for us. Now, I was doing my job. I was called. I didn't know Mr. Bloom. I didn't know Mr. Bloom. I was just doing my duty. Now, it may or may not be true that it's entirely up to us to call. But the act of calling for the elders to come pray for you is an act of faith. It puts wheels on your faith. Puts action to it. You should call. The action gives meaning to the expectation of God's power being manifest. It can even come through a faithless preacher. James then gives us another condition that goes towards our being healed, and you ain't going to like this one. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. He gives us a tough one here. A condition for healing that few of us are willing to put into practice. Confession of sins. Now, this is not the generic saying, oh yeah, I'm a sinner. It's not that. It doesn't qualify. It's the admitting of the particular wrong thing that has been done. Sometimes, now hear me, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes that particular wrong thing is directly associated with our problem. Now to give you a simple illustration that you'll all agree with, a hangover. Okay, a hangover is a, is a problem that's a result of the wrong thing that we've done, directly connected, okay? Now, we saw this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at wisdom and the refusal to learn. 
We were looking in Proverbs and it says, Therefore they shall eat the fruit of their way and have their fill of their own devices. Now this is not an isolated idea in the Bible that we looked at. There are a lot of them. I'm going to give you five real quick. But the idea that our behavior has its own consequences. We know that and we talk about it, but a lot of times we go for prayer and we should, I guess, but more often than that, we just need to stop whatever it is we're doing and it'll help it. But let's look at some of the ideas in the scripture. It says, whoever sows injustice will reap calamity and the rod of his fury will fail. Doesn't say God's going to get you for that. It says your actions did it to you. Same here. As I have seen those who plow iniquity, so trouble and so trouble reap the same. They reap iniquity and trouble in their lives. So it's a consequence of behavior. And yet, how often I have people ask me to pray for them for this situation going on in our life, that and the other. And I think that we might miss something. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. Now, those three verses all speak to the wicked doing things and reaping their results. But Paul tells us, don't be deceived, because God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Now, he doesn't say that God does it. What we're to understand here is that God has set principles in motion that we need to understand. And one of those principles is you're going to reap what you sow. And, we ta- and so we looked at those verses just, just a moment ago about sowing trouble. What are you going to get? Trouble. And he explains it by saying, for the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Now, that can be taken naturally and spiritually, the flesh. Okay? Sowing to the flesh, reaping corruption. Eating, eating things that don't serve you well all the time. Missing out on the stuff that, that does. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hurt you. It catches up to us eventually. But I don't want us to think that all sickness is caused by sinful behavior, because that's simply not true. However, here's the, the caveat. However, if the Spirit of God has made something known to you in your heart, then it is wise to confess that when you're asking for prayer. Okay? Okay. When you, if you call for prayer for a hangover, you need to admit. Not say, Pastor, I've got an awful headache. You need to admit, Pastor, I had too much to drink last night. Okay? You just need to be up front with it. Because the psalmist tells us that if I had cherished, that means keep it hidden, iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. We need to make the things known when we have messed up. And occasionally we mess up. However, this is not to say, I have to keep balancing all this, this is not to say that we have to be sinlessly perfect, okay, in order to be heard or for our prayers to be answered. Because James goes on to tell us in the passage we were reading that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I can go back and tell you the stories of Elijah and where he sinned, where he failed God. But he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Elijah was like us, it says, or we're like Elijah. We have the same nature, but God heard and answered his prayers. Now, there's a reason that's given, and we need to see that reason. We've talked about sin and the confession of sin. We've talked about messing up in our lives. We've talked about calling for others to pray for us. 
But there's another key here. Let's look at the second half of verse 16. I showed you the first half. The second half says, The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Okay? The prayer of a righteous person. It's the prayer of a righteous person that has the power, not the prayer of a sinner. Remember the Pharisees said, we know that God doesn't answer a sinner's prayers. Well, that's not true. But in this condition that we're talking about, we've talk, I pointed out that there are many different types of prayer and ways of prayer, and we're talking about praying for others for their healing. But it's the prayer of the righteous person. And you may be thinking, well, that rules me out when it comes to righteousness. Not so fast. Not so fast. If you think that, then you're leaning on your own strength and your own understanding because you're not agreeing with what the scripture says. So I want us to consider one last verse that puts, for me, puts the icing on the cake for everything else I've said. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, Paul writes, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Do you remember the prophecy in Isaiah chapter 53? Surely he has borne our griefs, has borne our sorrows. Okay. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And in him, we have become the righteousness of God. In Christ, we are righteous. Righteousness is not about our behavior. It's not about how long you can continue without committing a sin. It is only about Jesus. That's what righteousness is about. It is the Old Testament concept, the Old Covenant concept that says you've got to do right to be right. No. Jesus did it all. We are in him, and the scripture says, in him there is no sin. We are the righteous ones who can offer powerful, effective prayer for those in need. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. He has made you that way. But you turn around and look at your behavior, and you forget that truth, that reality. Your behavior does not deny or disprove the reality of what God has done. So I want you to begin to see yourself as righteous because of Christ and your relationship to him. Not based on whether or not you screwed up this morning. That's not what righteousness is about. Let go of that sin consciousness. Because that's all it is. Begin to bring the needs of others before the Lord and begin to expect and see the changes you desire. Take your prayer list, whatever's on your prayer list, the one that we offer here has names on it that you know, some that you don't. Take this church, lifting it up to the Lord, and expect to see the changes that you're asking for. Believe that what you're praying will come to pass. We can all improve on our prayer life. Okay, That's not a question. So let's begin to see that there's more to prayer than just making requests. There is the sitting quietly with the Lord to hear what he has to say and agreeing with that. I don't know about you, but I'd rather agree with the Lord on what he says than anything else that I might want in my mind. There is the place of becoming one with the Lord in thought, word, and deed. And regardless of our age, regardless of how long we've walked with the Lord or how long we have not or how many times we failed, there is a place that we can begin to learn this, to come into the presence of God and stay there. There's no need to leave. We can spend the time. But that's what it takes, friends. 
is not the quick prayer that we mimicked last week. Hey God, it's me. Here's my list. Thanks. Bye. Let's change that type of prayer and learn to spend a little bit more time. The song was sweet hour of prayer. For most of us, that means, well, prayer at this hour, not for an hour. Take some time to spend alone. No pressure, nothing to do, and each time something comes up, well, I got to get, push it aside. Spend time alone with the Lord in prayer, even if you never say a word.